please greet A. Edward Major. Well, thank you. I'm certainly not used to this kind of treatment. It usually is me appearing in front of a judge who's sort of scowling at me, saying, uh, counsel, please get to the point. <laughs> um, when you think of Magna Carta, I want you to think of this first, please. As much as they do this to the least of those, they do it to me. That's the essence of Magna Carta. Magna Carta is a um, rather inconspicuous uh, document, if ever you've had the chance uh, to see one or see a facsimile of one. Um, it's uh, rather hard to read. It's uh, written in medieval Latin. Um, and uh, it, it, in certain places anyway, it's in fact quite difficult to translate. But interestingly, on Constitution Day, uh, take note, Magna Carta has never been more cited in, in law, in history, uh, than it, it has been in recent years. It's fantastic. Um, it's a, um, when it is cited, it's, it is considered a prima facie uh, authority. So it's almost the highest authority that one can go to even at, uh, at times above and beyond what uh, is uh, when the Constitution itself is cited. So think about the year 1215, uh, June 15th. In a rather, another very inconspicuous uh, part of Magna Carta is where it was signed. It was signed in the middle of a swamp. Uh, it was uh, in, uh, near a tributary to the Thames River. And uh, an interesting side, this is just the archaeologist in me, but uh, an interesting aside to it is that the place was in fact inconspicuous, but rather intentionally chosen. And uh, you have to think of the fact that there have been several years of revolt uh, by the uh, barons of, uh, of England where they are contesting the authority of uh, the king. And they've chosen Runnymede very uh, particularly <coughs> so that there could not be uh, any last minute raid uh, that could be done on the party that was there present, either by the Kingsmen uh, raiding the barons or vice versa. Uh, but we do know that uh, when they did show up at the field for the sealing of the document, uh, notice I said sealing, not signing, um, because uh, other than the few clerics that were present, nobody knew how to write. In fact, almost nobody present there knew how to read either. Um, so uh, it was done there uh, at, in the swampy area, be not that foot soldiers couldn't uh, raid, but <coughs> cavalry couldn't raid, so, uh, because they would sink in, 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 the, uh, in the swamp. So I want to address uh, Magna Carta in three different ways uh, today and try to take you um, maybe into some areas that you don't find in the common press. Um, and they are for you to think about Magna Carta, one, as a legal bargain, one. I want to go into some of the specific clauses of the Magna Carta itself and then last but not least I want to um, go into the role of the church uh, in the whole uh, uh, enacting of uh, Magna Carta, uh, which has largely been whitewashed uh, out of history. So, first of all, think of it uh, as a bargain. It's struck <coughs> on the brink of civil war. John has been holed up in a church uh, in London, a very wonderful church, should fortune ever bring you to London, it's a must-see. It's called Temple Church. And it's called Temple Church because it was the church of the Knights Templars, who we're later going to discuss a little bit further. Um, the uh, magnets uh, offered fealty and homage to the king. In return, the king is offering uh, the liberties of the 63 chapters uh, that follow. Um, not just to the magnets, but to, and the quote is, the free men 
of England and their heirs forever. So interesting, maybe legalistic point to you, but free man um, is a much broader definition than those that forced John's hand, the barons. Um, in fact, uh, England at the time probably had something like 40,000 freemen. So freemen would be people like us today, but who would also be tenant farmers, tenant farmers who were not slaves. So, um, an expansion of liberties. Uh, but um, here's uh, now the lawyer in me. But the exchange uh, does not really work. First of all, the, the magnates already owed fealty and homage to the king. So what the, what the barons were offering was something that they already owed. So an important part of any uh, contract is that there be consideration. So the consideration that the barons offered was no consideration at all. Further, uh, does the king really have the ability to pass these rights along, these 63 items? Does he really have the authority to do that? It's, that's unprecedented uh, before. And when I say unprecedented, think of Magna Carta as being about the fourth in the line of important documents which are granting rights, rights that had never been granted before. So Magna Carta is not a standalone document in terms of that. There is precedent for what it is that has been done, but all of these are uh, really being enforced um, at the point of a sword is really uh, what's happening. So in other words, another reason to believe that there, this is not a legally binding contract. The Pope didn't think so either, uh, as, uh, as we're going to get into. And he throws the whole thing out two months after uh, it's signed, two months and nine days. Um, uh, now, uh, these are the rights of the king, and do his people uh, have a right to any or a right to demand consideration from their king? So this is an interesting concept. If the king is this uh, superior person uh, above the hoi polloi that the freemen consisted of and even the barons consisted of, what right did they have to demand anything of their king? Uh, so, um, last but not least, do the barons have the right to possess any of these rights? These are all open questions, and uh, it begs the validity of uh, Magna Carta uh, to begin with. In form, uh, the document uh, is straight out of a feudal lawyer's form book for deeds. So here's the consideration, I'm going to give you $10 or I'm going to give you a peppercorn, which used to be um, uh, a, a fictitious form of consideration that was used in contracts. So I'm going to give you uh, consideration and what are you going to give me in return? Well, you're going to give me these 63 rights. So that's the form of the document itself. But in substance, it's, it's not really consideration. It's a grant of civil and political rights. Um, and it is a poor match. So um, is it a public treaty or is it a private contract? Uh, a statute or a royal grant? Neither side honored it. Not for any time at all. Neither side. Now, as for the actual clauses, um, if opportunity brings you to, to them, I'm going to focus just on two of the clauses. Uh, a third clause I haven't really gotten into as much, uh, but it is what has come down to us today as being taxation without representation. So think the Boston Tea Party. Um, but I want to focus in on two other uh, clauses which are really very much more subtle can find out all you need to know about the taxation without representation uh, through um, literature. Plenty of it uh, is out there. There are two more subtle things that I want to uh, bring to your attention. And 
they are subjects that fascinated me, uh, first of all, as a law student here in the United States, um, but in my reading of, of English law and becoming a solicitor in England. And one of the things that I found so very, very interesting is that even though um, when we declared independence from Britain, we brought in wholesale, that is, including Magna Carta, we brought the common law into our law wholesale. So even though we decided we didn't like the Brits, we still liked the government and we still liked the law. So um, what happened was, instead of our branching out two different ways and going different directions, what really happened is, is if you can, can think of uh, maybe a grapevine, uh, there was a break in what they did, but then our laws developed under very, very parallel lines. Their sense of justice is very similar to our own. Um, and uh, it, this is demonstrated in, in many ways. There's a lot of cross-fertilization uh, between our two different laws. And if, if for no other reason, the fact that Magna Carta is cited today more than it ever was is just an astounding fact as far as I'm concerned. Anyway, the two clauses are 39 and 40 <coughs> of those 63. 39 and 40. And I'm just going to read you snippets from each. No free man uh, shall be taken or in any way ruined except by judgment of his peers or the law of the land. So no, not the king. 40. No one will we sell, to no one will we delay right or justice. These two concepts are really quite closely connected. And uh, in that way, understand that freedom is in some ways being equated with security uh, and property ownership and not the king's or anyone else's whim. For 39, it says judgment of his peers or the law of the land. So these are two very interesting ideas. Judgment of his peers is a concept that goes back hundreds of years before <coughs> Magna Carta. And what juries used to be, in fact, the earliest juries, in other words, when you weren't just appearing in front of, um, of a magnet or, uh, or a king or someone who was judging you, you know, maybe appearing in front of King Solomon. Uh, so when we are judged by our peers, peers was originally defined to be people who knew about the incident in question. So if somebody is, this lady right here, got accused of stabbing this lady over here. Mm. And so the people that would be chosen as the jury would be the people who knew something about that incident. And they would be the ones that made the decision about what was done. Magna Carta changes the rules a little bit. And Magna Carta says, it's your peers, it's not just the people that knew something about the incident in question, uh, they were your peers. So this is a very important concept because the, your peers are people that could understand your motivations. They're people like you and me. It's not a king who's deciding, you know, whether or not it's thumbs up or it's, uh, you know, give them the ax um, to uh, further their own agenda. It's people who think and act just like you and me. Huge, huge uh, concept uh, that protects us to this day. Um, now, the real nub of this thing, at least to me, and one of the most mysterious things about it all, is that um, you, you, you can be taken or you can be in some way ruined, using the language, um, if the law of the land dictates so. So um, law of the land is a, is a very mysterious term. So what is the law of the land? Is there something by virtue of the fact that I'm standing in, on, in Lower Broadway, 
Is there something here uh, that just because I'm here that I'm granted certain rights? Um, is, there some, is it something cultural? Is it something just because I'm in lower Manhattan? Or just what the devil is this? Um, it's a fascinating co concept to me because, again, one of the uh, big things about uh, all of this is that the natural rights which every Englishman considered to, was considered to possess, something that he had just because he was an Englishman, these rights were granted and could not be taken away by the tyranny of any authority. And that's one of the things that's so, so incredible about Magna Carta is that it recognizes these rights. So in our terminology, we say we find these rights inalienable. So there's something about being an American uh, that we can't define it, perhaps. Um, but there are these rights that even though we can't find a printed law, um, we find it maybe uh, in our customs. We find it um, in our actions. We find, we find it in this innate sense of liberty and justice that we think that every Englishman or every American is entitled to. Um, further, uh, these rights spring from God and are inherent in the land in which we live. Common sense, um, an eternal sense of right and, and wrong, um, and we are so fortunate to live in a commonwealth country. Uh, we are so fortunate um, and makes us distinct from all the rest of the world, all the rest of the world uh, mostly just the non-English speaking world, has something which is called civil law. So how are our, our different bodies of laws founded? In common law, our law is generated out of a real dispute. It's real people, it's real facts, it's human emotions, um, it's human senses of justice. But it's a real controversy and the law issues directly out of a real controversy. Compare that now with a civil law country um, and think of somebody, uh, probably a politician, a legislator of some kind, um, who might be in a back room someplace scratching his beard trying to figure out um, what, is, what is a sense of justice. How are we going to deal with a problem that we, we are now facing. In other words, it's not a real situation. It's somebody thinking something up and trying to come up with a solution. But when, on the other hand, you are a judge and you can look into the eyes of the litigants and you can seek a resolution through that experience, you can see it's, it's a very much more real fountain for the law. We have that great blessing when we have the common law. Um, the other thing is about the common law <coughs> is that uh, the, the reaction of the judge is real and it's visceral. Now, I promise to get into some of the whitewash uh, that has taken place uh, about the religious <coughs> aspect, the role of the church in the founding, uh, in the um, uh, drafting and the sealing of Magna Carta. So I mentioned to you that there was civil strife. Uh, these barons are running around the country. Uh, they're taking the law into their own hands. Don't think of the barons necessarily as, as little angels, right, uh, giving us uh, these great liberties that we now treasure today. They weren't so bad, and they weren't such good guys either. Um, they, for example, they didn't abide by the Magna Carta, as I mentioned, um, and neither did, did King John. But these guys are running around the countryside, uh, raising private armies, deciding what it is that they want to do and what they 
what they finally come up with is a, a uniting under this common purpose uh, to uh, rid the country of one of the worst kings that England ever had, King John. And he was a scallywag uh, right, right from the beginning. You Southerners uh, that are present here know what a scallywag is, but not, not a very good guy. He's the youngest of, I believe it's four sons, and um, you, you may know a little bit about uh, the legend of, of Robin Hood, and John comes in at the end um, because his brother, Richard, Richard the Lionhearted, um, Richard the Lionhearted is imprisoned in um, Austria, present-day Austria, and, uh, and he's being held hostage there for uh, a ransom to be paid. So, um, John declares him dead. My brother, my own brother, I declare him dead so that I can take uh, control of the throne. The two other sons uh, also died uh, in battles uh, in present-day France, which was then uh, largely a part of the English Empire. Uh, by the way, um, Order of the Garter, you ever hear of that? The Order of the Garter in England, it's, it's one of the highest orders that's there. Um, on the, uh, the motto for Order of the Garter is Oni soit qui mal y pense, which is uh, Norman French, and, but what it means is evil is he who evil thinks. That's one translation. Uh, another translation is that um, if you um, do not recognize the English crown's right to lands in England, excuse me, in France, you are an evil person. <laughs> That's where, where it comes from. It's uh, interesting. So one third of present day France used to be a part of Britain at the beginning of John's reign. In very short order, he loses it, and he loses it all. So he, he's fighting these wars. He, is, uh, he doesn't really know how to, to run an army, but he's out there. He wants to be uh, in control of how things are done, not his generals. Um, and he ends up losing everything, and he has to impose these ruinous taxes. So one of the reasons why the barons are very upset, the things that they could do, and by the way, this was a thing that was done right up through the American Civil War, is um, rather than serving, men uh, have a required service, rather than serving if you were um, <coughs> better than a free man. Free men had, no, excuse me, free men uh, also <coughs> could pay money and get someone else to serve in their place. They, uh, John had increased that tax a great deal. He had increased several other taxes too. Um, one of the rather peculiar uh, clauses that's in Magna Carta concerns the authority to um, make an arranged marriage for a widow. Uh, and th this could be done, uh, if you didn't want the arranged marriage, you could <coughs> cause the marriage to be whoever the, the widow wanted to be remarried to, but only at the payment of a very large price. It's very difficult to read that clause, but anyway, that's what that's all about. So what John is doing is he's looking for any and every way to raise money so that he can get back to France and, and fight these wars. And the nobles are saying, enough's enough. Um, you should really stay out of this business. Uh, let's go back a, another day, which of course the English do, uh, but, um, but not uh, anyway at this time. There's a lot of stuff, speaking about peculiar things, there's a lot of stuff about eel weirs in the Thames River. <laughs> so what on earth is an eel weir? Uh, an eel weir is a, a, a V-shaped um, low dam, and it's a, a way to, um, to catch migrating eels in the uh, Thames River. And uh, it's obviously not an issue today, but uh, in, in that day, that was a big deal. So there was a lot uh, that concerned uh, the barons about this because this was a source of income uh, for them. 
So, looking at the relationship of the drafting of Magna Carta uh, to the role of the church <coughs> and the recognition of, recognition of the hand of God. Um, it, the document itself, um, a little bit like the <coughs> Code of Hammurabi, if you if ever had the chance to, to see that. Um, Hammurabi, here he is, he, he claims himself to be the master of the world. And, uh, you know, if you read the code, you'll see there's a whole lot of uh, um, uh, information that he, he gives about what a great man uh, he is. But first thing even Hammurabi does, and John does, it begins with the quote, from reverence for God and for the salvation of our soul and those of our ancestors and heirs, for the honor of God and the exaltation of, of holy church, and the reform of the realm. Um, further, what is the first grant of liberty? Think of our Bill of Rights. What's um, uh, the First Amendment? So think the same thing. In the first place, we, meaning the royal we, so in the first place, King John has granted to God and by our present charter confirmed for us and for our heirs in perpetuity that the English church shall be free and shall have its rights undiminished and its liberties unimpaired. So First Amendment, uh, another whitewash about First Amendment is everyone says, that's oh, that's freedom of speech. It's not just freedom of speech, it's freedom of religion uh, as well. Um, so here's John. First right that he grants is, is the freedom of the church. Then uh, let us look at the intervention of the Archbishop of Can Canterbury, Stephen Langton. Um, another uh, place, if fortune brings you to England, is make sure that you take the opportunity to see Canterbury. You can see Stephen Langton's uh, tomb that's there. And it's a very peculiar uh, tomb because uh, someone decided, someone at a, a much later time, decided to build a chapel uh, within uh, Canterbury itself and to expand it out from what it used to be. Stephen Langton was originally buried just outside the wall of the church. Even though he had this seminal importance, as we're soon to discuss, um, in, with Magna Carta, uh, the, uh, this chapel was expanded out, but nobody surveyed it properly. So when you go to see Canterbury today, uh, Stephen Langton's head is outside the walls of Canterbury Cathedral, and most of his torso is inside this chapel. So it's a, a bit peculiar to see. Uh, John is holed up in the temple church months prior to the sealing of the charter. Uh, because he was uh, fearing for his life. And he realized that the barons, whoever, you know, whatever bad guys they were, they wouldn't uh, violate the sanctity of the church and they would not come in. Further, they would not come in because some pretty tough guys were inside the church and they were the Knights Templars, um, including William Marshall, um, who if ever you have the chance to uh, read about uh, about knights of the medieval age. He is probably the most famous knight that ever lived. He's also an interesting person because he was a commoner, uh, but he married uh, a princess and later on in life uh, does very well for himself, thank you. But, uh, but he travels all around the world and I think he's undefeated uh, in the tournament. Uh, <clears throat> The Knights Templar and uh, the clergy, don't think of them as loyalists. Don't think of them as being supporters of John. Think of them as being public servants. Think of them as people who are trying to do the right thing for England. And they realize that even though we've got this really bad king um, who's a good for nothing and he's taxing us and forcing us into military service, and he's doing all these nasty things, he's still the king. Um, so he does play an important role, 
and we don't want to have a widespread <coughs> insurrection all around the country. So we've got to do something with him because just by virtue of his office, we cannot ignore him. Um, and it's their job, Langton um, included, uh, they're there to help make a deal. Um, Marshall uh, himself um, escorted uh, John around much of the time. Marshall was standing beside John when he sealed Magna Carta at Runnymede. Um, Langton is a very interesting person. Langton um, was the man of the hour. Langton's specialty uh, was as an expert in the book of Deuteronomy. And Deuteronomy is a very, very important book for kings because it defines a king's role in, in um, God's world. And um, I have a, uh, I've got a, a beautiful little um, pamphlet. It's a hand-colored pamphlet that uh, my mother and father uh, attended the uh, coronation of George VI. And um, on this uh, handout that was given to everyone who was in attendance is a statement, a quote from Deuteronomy, which reads as follows. God removeth kings and setteth up kings. There is no king save by the multitude of an host. Mighty man is not delivered uh, by much strength. It is he that giveth salvation unto a king. Uh, in 1225, uh, this is now two months uh, after the uh, Magna Carta is enacted, the Pope uh, intervenes. John says, I've been hoodwinked. Um, I, I only signed this under duress at the point of a sword. And you've got to help me. You've got to step in. And you've got to undo this. This is a request by a man who was excommunicated by the Pope just a few years prior to this. But John says, listen, I'll be a good guy. I'll be your humble servant. I'll recognize your authority, Pope, if you will help me to overcome this, these nasty people uh, that uh, have held me hostage. Um, one of the things that happens, though, in, t in 1225 is uh, Magna Carta, yourself, you see, had no teeth to enforce it. It was a, a series of bargains that go back and forth, but there was nothing which stated, it's like there's no penal code in a, in a body of, of criminal law. There's, there's no way to punish people for doing what it is that they've done. Langton's lasting <coughs> legacy is not only to bring John to the table, get him to come out of that church, so that he can negotiate uh, with the nobles um, and sign off on this document. Um, but uh, in 1225, 10 years later, uh, it's now not John, it's John's son. And John signs another uh, Magna Carta, actually several of them over time, um, and uh, uh, puts teeth to the document itself. So very, very important. Um, it was actually, prior to that, it was reenacted uh, 14 months after the 1215 version uh, was, was thrown out. The Pope annulled the agreement on the basis of uh, the intimidation of John and that Magna Carta was, and I quote, vile and base, but illegal and iniquitous. Those who sought to uh, enforce it would be excommunicated. Now, the point of the document um, and why it should uh, occupy such a palladium, uh, a great and a beneficent place in legal history, is that it proclaims natural rights. Uh, it names certain rules and customs which are considered to be of the land uh, as being law itself. But since it was disavowed only two months later after being sealed, um, why is it still maintained in such a fancy palladium? Disavowed as it was, uh, but then restated in slightly differing forms over the ages, uh, and its texts and terms continued 
as a battle cry of legal authority against tyranny and against any incursion of these rights. Magna Carta created a line in the sand where, if an authority of any kind, including the king himself, was to cross it, it would be palpably look wrong. So uh, that, uh, for example, uh, Sir Thomas More, uh, when he's talking about some of the illegal statutes, what he considered to be illegal statutes that had been passed by Henry VIII, he of the many wives, uh, he said that uh, it's against the law of the land and the uh, terms of Magna Carta. That's the terminology that he used. Some of the great jurists, early jurists, this is before the time of America, are Sir Edward Coke and Sir Will, uh, Cook, excuse me, spell Coke uh, the way we pronounce it, but it's pronounced Cook. So don't embarrass yourself if you're citing Cook and call him Coke. Uh, so uh, these, these two jurists, uh, Cook says in defense of uh, some expanding authority of James I, he's the, the Catholic king that comes back into to England. Um, one of the defenses that he uses, and he says that these laws are illegal, and he says it doesn't matter that the king wants to do this uh, because um, Magna Carta is such a fellow that he would have no sovereign. That's a quote. I, uh, I love it. I, I think that's just uh, makes the situation come, come alive for me. Um, so time and again, um, people have appealed to Magna Carta as a practical ground for opposition and a cloak of justification to any opposition to liberty. Uh, the importance of Magna Carta is only grown <coughs> through time. Its associations, traditions, aspirations have only clustered more thickly around it as time has gone on. It is a turning point in common law countries. Uh, they have never turned back uh, since Magna Carta. And our common law system shines brightly around the world, and you will see so many uh, countries around the world, including us, um, who have cited Magna Carta over and over again. If you see some of the early literature, some of the stuff that was um, uh, published by um, Paul Revere, uh, by Thomas Paine, you'll see sometimes in illustrations, you'll see the Patriot is fighting some bad guy and the Patriot's holding something in his hand and it's a piece of paper. There's one thing in particular, one uh, ad in particular that was circulated and on the piece of paper, so this is over 500 years later, the piece of paper has two words written on it, Magna Carta. So with that, God bless you all. I think when most Americans think of what our rights are, uh, what's, what's standing for the of tyranny, they think of federal state law, they think of the Bill of Rights. And I don't think most people think beyond that. Uh, they don't think, you said, you said when, when we founded this country, we brought English common law and Magna Carta and, and these other sources over wholesale. And they wouldn't have thought of them that, as bringing them over, they were there. Uh, they thought of themselves as Englishmen, and, and these were the rights of Englishmen, and so forth. In most people's thinking, this is this is this is gone. Are we the poor or for it? How so? Um, well, first of all, I just want to comment on on something that uh, Professor Innes just said, and it's a very insightful uh, comment. The the uh, fomenters of revolution in the United States were for the most part lawyers. They were English educated barristers. They went, they studied at the inns of court. Not all of them, some were uh, just locally uh, educated. For example, Thomas Jefferson. He was a lawyer, but he was locally educated. Uh, but he was educated by John Dickinson. He of Dickinson College in, in uh, the middle of uh, Pennsylvania. Um, 
and Dickinson was a, uh, a barrister uh, from the Inns of Court. In fact, I think he's from Inner Temple. Um, and uh, the, the people that were making the protest were not saying, hey, give us independence. That's not what they were all about. They were just saying, treat us like Englishmen. Treat us like Englishmen. So that, for example, if you uh, were to look at the grant of rights to uh, people that were settlers and investors and participants in the Virginia Company, so uh, the early people uh, that came to uh, the United States when they were settling in Virginia, they were those, they were named after the Virginia com uh, Company, also named after uh, the first uh, Caucasian uh, born in the United States uh, was a little baby um, who was named Virginia Dare, D-A-R-E. And um, you can see right where uh, she was uh, baptized in a funny little church uh, in London to this day. But in other words, they're not saying um, we want to be a separate country. They're saying, hey, we, we like your system. We, we think you've got a great system going here. And we just want to be treated like everybody else. George III said, who was the then reigning uh, monarch of England, he said, no, 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 you're just colonists. Um, and you're not entitled to rights as, as Englishmen. And, uh, but yet, uh, you know, things like the charter of the Virginia Company said, oh yeah, not only are you entitled to all the rights and privileges of Englishmen, but you're entitled to the rights and privileges of every other um, settlement, English settlement around the world. So if there are rights that are greater uh, in uh, New Zealand uh, to what they are in Britain, we get the best. We're, we're entitled to that type of treatment. So very insightful. One of the th reasons that, that I think the back more directly to your, your question, Professor. One of the things that um, I, I think that we sometimes avoid the British connection um, is our strained attempt to be politically correct. Um, in other words, if you were to look at something, maybe this is a little deep, uh, <laughs> but uh, permit me this uh, flight of fancy. If you look at things like foreign policy, you see this tremendous effort that we go to in the United States to make sure that we are not showing favoritism to one foreign nation over another. And sometimes it absolutely defies logic why we should do that. Um, and I can give you a very practical um, example of this. Uh, before I say anything further, are there any Canadians present? Uh -oh. All right. Well, you two are in trouble. Um, and let me just tell you why. So I have a son who's a serving officer in the Army. And he's overseas uh, in, this was initially uh, in Iraq. And he's an engineer. He's a combat engineer. He has this really nasty job of locating and clearing IEDs. They are the big killers and the big maimers. They cause more uh, injury and death than anything else. So it's his job to locate and, and dispose of these nasty things. Most foreign nations, including the Canadians, did not send <coughs> engineers. So that was fine. Our, our engineers were there. We had plenty of them. They were there to uh, mostly clear the roads. That's mostly what it's all about. Um, but there are Danes out there, um, no, no, um, uh, no engineers, and the Brits are out there too. Um, so my son had to serve with a, a lot of these <coughs> different nations, and it was a fascinating cultural experience. Um, but one of the things that he found was that when the explosions went off, almost everybody went the other way. These guys that are supposed to be there, and they're supposed to be fighting like we are. As soon as the going gets tough, they're going the opposite way. Sorry to say, the Canadians did that too. 
Um, I don't know why that should be because Canadians, Canadian Army are, are great fighters. I, it's okay, I don't hold you personally responsible. <laughs> um, but the Brits stayed and the Brits were there uh, to complete the mission and they were there to fight. It's another thing about when I'm talking about that parallelism uh, that exists in our legal system. Our sense of what's right and wrong. Uh, there's a lot of people, uh, including most of Europe, that are prepared to go along with us when we're resisting tyranny today and they're prepared to give all the lip service to it. But it's really only a very few nations that are prepared to shed blood uh, in order to fight for, for liberty and, and uh, against uh, tyranny. So sometimes it boggles my mind why in foreign policy, we have to fight so hard not to admit that we have this great and close uh, British connection. I'm British in background, so maybe I'm, uh, I'm prejudiced, prejudiced in, in that manner. Um, but at the same time, I, it's, uh, it's factual. You can, you can count on it. So, sorry, long-winded answer to a short question. <laughs> Do you have any questions for our speaker? I don't bite, I promise. Not at least in front of the rest of you. I don't bite. This lunch is the main Okay. Well, it certainly is a pleasure to, to speak in front of you. And, uh, you know, like, a, a, like the good book says, it's better to give in, than to receive. And I certainly have enjoyed uh, doing this with you all today. And um, make sure that you make your time. Uh, it, it's, do the very best that you can while you have this situation because you have such a unique arrangement here in lower Manhattan to have a Christian college like this. You know, you, you really are an, an anomaly and uh, you have such a great opportunity here. Don't be a dope like me and, you know, waste most of your time uh, in college um, because after you graduate, you will never have an opportunity to do this again. You'll never, no matter what your circumstances are, you'll never have this unique relationship that you have before you now. So please, um, for the sake of the church, make the most of it. So we'll, we'll, all, we'll all go out now and, and look up the top ten benefits we have from English common law, and BuzzFeed, <laughs> and stuff like this. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>